here with the mic unmuting itself. My name is Jesse, everyone, and welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here to kick off the week at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, but if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. A big thank you to all of you for joining us as we continue to showcase and celebrate such amazing explorers and scientists around the globe. We are in our home stretch. We're in like the final five weeks of broadcast now. I think we've got 50 broadcasts in five weeks or more. So it's going to be a really insane time. You can check all that out on our website and you can see everything we do on our YouTube channel as well. So lots more to learn and discover there. Now today we are going to have a Kahoot. I'll say that before we get underway. So in about 25 minutes between the talk and the Q&A portion, if you want to join us with this game pin, and I will bring this up again, four quick questions to keep it a little extra interactive and fun today. Now today I'm really excited for a number of reasons. One, we're bringing back one of my all-time favorite speakers and by far the most individually featured speaker we've ever had on the broadcast and that is George Perunas. George, I'll, I'll just bring you in as I give you the introduction. I don't do usually do this, but welcome back, George. Uh, it's been like, it's been a long time that they've had George in, but we've had George featured from all over the planet, Antarctica, Mexico, Vanuatu. We've talked about wild storm chasing. His Thunderbolt and Lightning episode, which is on that YouTube channel, is still one of my all-time favorite of 1,500 broadcasts I've hosted, so you can check that out below when you're done. Um, and I'm so thrilled to have him back today to talk about his Borneo expedition. Borneo is one of the most biodiverse and amazing places on this planet. We're going to talk about some really cool creatures. We're going to showcase some images of a really special and uniquely tropical and rich place on this planet and you know without further ado really i'm just going to turn it over to you to start doing that because no one wants to hear me talk for half an hour but george welcome back man <laughs> thank you jesse and oh my goodness that is so not true <laughs> you are wonderful and thank you again for uh for the invitation to come and uh allow me to come in and talk about some of my most recent adventures and into one of the most interesting places in the world and as you mentioned uh, Borneo is indeed one of the most biodiverse places on planet Earth. So they have more variety of species than most anywhere else on the planet. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about some of those species. We're going to be talking about some of the primates that live there. We're going to be talking about some of the invertebrates that live there. And also uh, take you to one of the largest caves in the world and to show you what happens every evening right before sunset something amazing happens there so let's dig in get right at it shall we let me get set here we go perfect i just put the kahoot link for everyone in the chat on youtube and Streamyard as well so you all have that uh we got class here texas maryland ontario more it's really exciting to have you guys all here and uh george you are pretty much you're like it's so it wants to come up you're good to go perfect awesome <laughs> Yes. So today we're talking about one island in particular, Borneo. And so where is Borneo? Well, it's in the Pacific. It's sort of sandwiched between Australia and the mainland of, uh, of, of Asia there. And it is a big island. It is the third largest island in the world. It's the largest island in Asia. It's so big that there are three countries that are all part of the island of Borneo. You've got, most of it is Indonesia, part of it is Malaysia, and part of it is Brunei. It's about 750,000 square kilometers or 288,000 square miles. It's really, really big. And the part that we're gonna be talking about today is the light green part, the Malaysian side of Borneo. And a lot of people live here, about 23 million people in total. There are some big cities here, but what it's best known for is its rainforest, beautiful jungle, tropical rainforest. When you think of rainforest, this is like the, the textbook rainforest. So many birds, so many insects, so many just species in general. It really is amazing. All kinds of uh, reptiles and amphibians. This little uh, lizard guy posed for me quite nicely. Uh, just absolutely gorgeous. Some of the bird species, this is their most famous bird, this is a hornbill. And these things are quite large. You see them flying through the jungle all the time. They're, they're this spectacular uh, adornment on the top of their head. It really is I mean, incredible. Wild boars. So there's uh, several mammal species there, some big ones. Uh, there's one of the babies, a baby wild boar, just sort of trekking through the jungle, following mama around as they do. Uh, but primates are probably the most famous species from Borneo. And there's a handful of different types of primates that live there. 
Uh, some are monkeys and some are apes. And if you don't know the difference between a monkey and an ape, you can tell really quickly because monkeys have tails, apes do not. So chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, they're all apes. These uh, long-tailed macaques are monkeys. Uh, you can tell by the name, clearly, it's a long-tailed macaque. And these guys are mischievous. If, if someone is going to come along and steal your lunch, it's going to be these guys. They're everywhere, and they get into a lot of trouble. They love mischief. And uh, you, you got to be really careful with these guys. You can't leave anything sitting around because they will steal it. They're little thieves. Um, some of the more dramatic primates. This is a monkey, the proboscis monkey, one of Jesse's favorites. And the proboscis, it's just referring to their gigantic nose. And it's the, the males have very large noses, uh, larger than the females, and it helps to attract a mate. So the bigger your nose, the more attractive you are in proboscis monkey civilization, if you will, in, in, their, in their ranks there. And they live along the coastline. They're, they have a special niche uh, ter territory where they live in these mangrove forests. And mangroves are these trees, these, these like a treeish bush. And they live along the salt water in the edges of the coastline. And that's the only place where you find these proboscis monkeys. And they've got their very agile, really long arms, really long legs, that prehensile tail. They can use the tail to wrap around uh, tree branches, use it for stability. They're excellent jumpers. Even when you've got a baby, uh, you know, <laughs> hatching, hitching a ride on you, as mama is here, uh, they're fascinating. And they travel in large troops. But the, the, the largest and certainly the most famous of all of the primates is the orangutan from Borneo, of course. And these guys are just fascinating. This, this was one of the main reasons why I went there, was to try and document these orangutans. They are so similar to us, uh, as you'll see. Uh, they are, they're big and they are capable of making and using tools. So I was really fortunate to be able to capture this photograph of this female orangutan. She's eating lunch. I think it's a banana or something. And uh, it was pouring rain. And so she made a rain hat out of some leaves. And it was just this amazing thing. It's, it's not very often witnessed. Uh, it, they do this, but it's not always uh, something that you see. They, they use a variety of different tools. They use sticks for um, getting termites out of holes, um, various other things. But in this particular instance, I actually saw this one building and using a rain hat. And it's just so cool because that's something that, that I would do if I was out there in the pouring rain. And they are so similar to us in terms of genetics. Almost 97% of our genes, our DNA, is the same as these orangutans. So they are some of our closest relatives. And the name orangutan actually means man of the forest in the Malaysian language. So when these were first spotted years ago and, and identified as a species, the, the local people thought, hey, there's some, there's some guy, some hairy guy living out in the forest. Kind of like a... Well, in North America, we have the Sasquatch, right? Well, here they have the orangutan, but the orangutan is real. And uh, so that's how it got its name. And there are three different species. They live on Borneo, they live on Sumatra, and a couple of other little islands, uh, but they're all critically endangered. There are fewer than, I believe, 150,000 in total left in the world. And we'll talk a little bit later about what's happening to their, uh, to their habitat. Um, they, they require a lot of space, and space is something the thing they're running out of. They are the heaviest tree-dwelling animal in the world. Uh, you would not want to fight one of these guys. They're extremely strong. Uh, they would win. I guarantee you, they would win. And they, they, they are ambidextrous. They can, they can eat with their hands, their left hand, their right hand. They can eat with their feet. They love fruit. Uh, they are very flexible and uh, agile creatures, despite their size. And they have a bedtime routine, just like we do, right? When it's time to go to bed, you maybe put your pajamas on, go brush your teeth. Well, they've got a nighttime ritual as well. They build a new nest in the trees every single night. And it takes them about 10 minutes to build it. 
and they'll build it out of leaves and twigs and stuff and they'll bed down for the night and then the next day they'll move on to some new part of the forest and that night they'll build a whole new nest so it's pretty interesting the uh, you sometimes come across in the forest these old nests because they build a new one every night you'll sometimes find their old nests and sometimes they'll reuse their nests and sometimes they'll use the nest that uh, someone else built the night before so they're very smart they're very flexible and uh, they, they, they do well in the forest. Another species, very different from the primates of Borneo, that also does very well in the forest, are the tiger leeches. So these are invertebrates. They have no bones. They're closely related to worms. And you can understand why they got the name tiger leech, because of their dark and, uh, you know, these black and orange stripes. They look kind of like a tiger. Um, but they're closely related to worms, and they eat blood. Most leeches live in the water. So if you're in the forest, in some parts of the world, if you go in the water and you come out of the water, you might have these leeches stuck to your skin. And that's, that's happened to me. But here, these are forest leeches. They live on the, on the branches and on the leaves. And what they do is they sit there and they wait. They're the most patient creatures in the world. They just wait for some mammal to come along. And they can detect the vibration. They've got little eyes. They can see and they can detect the carbon monoxide, or carbon dioxide rather, that you're breathing out. And if you get near a, a leaf with one of these leeches, they will stretch out and try to grab onto you. And once they do, they'll bite into your skin and uh, they will start to suck the blood out of you. And their saliva, their spit, has an anticoagulant in it. So it makes the blood flow much faster and easier. So they can drink your blood easier. And so they're the, the, the Hemidipsa. That's their Latin name, the genus. And it means bloodthirst. That's all they eat is blood. And these are, they live on the land, not in the water. So they're one of the few species of forest leeches. And they only go up about two meters or about six feet off the ground. You'll never find them high up in the trees because all their food, the animals that they live on, that they prey upon, they all live down along the ground. And they're able to eat many times their own weight in blood. Now think about that for a second. Imagine, you, I'm sure you like French fries, I sure do, but imagine eating an entire bathtub full of French fries. That's kind of what they do when they latch onto you and start sucking blood. They get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they just fill themselves up with blood, and then eventually they'll just drop off. And then they don't need to eat again for maybe several months. So here's one that's on my hand. It uh, latched on to me and it's uh, sucking the blood away. I'll show you the video here of us removing it. So they're not very big. And you can pluck them off. And you can see there's the little scar where it, uh, where it latched on to me. What you don't see is a few minutes later, it really starts to bleed down my arm because of that anticoagulant saliva in their, that they have in their mouths. So if you get bitten by a leech and you remove the leech, you will bleed quite a bit. So uh, we had everyone in our group, there was about 10 of us or so, every single one of us had leeches on us at some point. Uh, you walk through the jungle and when you get out of the jungle, you just looking on your body for leeches, you're looking on your friends, they're on your backpack, they're on your boots, they're on your pants, they're just, they get everywhere. They're gross, <laughs> they're so gross, but, they, they, uh, that's their home. They, 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 they love to uh, just hang out and wait. But probably the most fascinating spot in this entire trip were the caves of uh, Mulu National Park. And Borneo is home to some of the largest caves in the world. And that one of the ones that really fascinated me was a place called Deer Cave. And looking at the picture, it doesn't look like a whole lot. You see these cliff sides in the jungle, and you see this cave opening in sort of in the center of the screen there. But what you don't see is how huge this cave is on the inside. So real quick, how do caves form? Well, this type of rock is called limestone. It's basically ancient coral reef, millions and millions of years old. And it's permeable to water. And that means that rainwater can get into the rock and sort of flow through it. And the rainwater that flows through dissolves that limestone rock. And the rain is actually a little bit acidic. 
right? So if you stick your finger in acid, you're going to burn your finger. Don't do that, right? But as raindrops fall through the, the sky, through the atmosphere, they pick up a little bit of carbon dioxide, and that creates carbonic acid. So rainwater is just ever, ever, ever so slightly acidic. But when it rains for millions and millions of years over the same spot, and then the limestone soaks up that uh, that uh, that rainwater, this process called dissolution happens. And so basically, this acid, this very mild acid, eats away at this limestone over millions of years. And what you end up with are these gigantic, gigantic caves here. These this cave is so big that you could technically, you could fly a like a jumbo jet through this cave. It is absolutely massive. It's hard to, to take photos of this cave and to be able to understand how big it is. Uh, it's just so, so massive. Um, there are waterfalls inside the cave. Uh, there, there are entire ecosystems in the cave. It is massive. It was first discovered in 1961, so relatively new. It's out in the middle of nowhere, so uh, people didn't know about it for, for a very, very long time. And the reason it got the name Deer Cave is because the local deer would wander, not wander, they would intentionally go into the cave and uh, they would sort of lick the rocks to get salt uh, into, their, into their diet. And so the locals named it Deer Cave because that's where the deer would go. It's the second largest cave passage in the world. The largest is in Vietnam, a place called Han Song Don Cave, and it was only recently discovered maybe 10 years ago. So it's amazing that we're still able to discover things, even to this day, that are so huge. There are places on this planet where we have not set foot, and that's what I find so fascinating about these caves. If you discover a new cave, which, which I have, I've been part of teams that have discovered new caves, every step you take is a place where no human has ever been before. And I find that really amazing. And also, it's home to lots of bats. And when I say lots of bats, I mean lots of bats. Millions of bats live in this one particular cave. And uh, every night, these bats come out to go feed. And we're going to talk more about that, because this is extremely cool. So take a real close look at this photo. You can see the sky and you can see the clouds. And if you look right in the middle, going up and down, you see sort of a black squiggly line. Those are all bats. So what happens is the bats that live in this cave, and there's about 12 different species of bats that live in this cave, they come out just before sunset because bats are nocturnal, right? They sleep during the day. They come out at night to feed. Some bats, they uh, feed on uh, uh, fruits. Some bats feed on blood, right? Vampire bats. And there are vampire bats that live in this cave. But most of the bats here, they feed on insects. And there are between two and a half to three and a half million bats in this one particular cave. And there are lots of caves around here, but this one has, seems to have the most bats. That's a lot of bats. That's like an entire city's worth of bats. Imagine a whole city of people, but they're all bats. And the, the most common bat in Deer Cave is the wrinkle-lipped bat. And they eat about 15 tons of flying insects every single night. So some people are afraid of bats, uh, but really bats are our friends because they love to eat things like mosquitoes and, and other insects that we find irritating. So bats are our friends, and uh, here they certainly have a lot of them. And the bats are able to find these insects flying at night when there's no light whatsoever because they have very sophisticated echolocation. They make little squeaks. <coughs> and the sound that they squeak, that sound bounces off of insects and reflects back to them. And their hearing is so good that they're able to hear these audio reflections and determine where the insect is and then fly through the air and catch it while it's flying. It's amazing. So there's a, a close-up of these wrinkle-lipped bats, and you can understand how they got their name. They're very, you know, they're not the prettiest looking creature in the world, but they serve a very important purpose in the ecosystem. But they certainly do have wrinkly lips. And every night, a river in the sky full of bats comes out and emerges. 
And I witnessed this on two different evenings while I was there. And you basically just have to sit and wait. And uh, you can see them starting to, to gain altitude in the cave. Bats can't fly straight up very well. So to gain altitude, to get up higher in the sky, they have to go in circles, kind of like a tornado of bats. It's really amazing to watch. And then at one point, they start streaming out of the cave. And they'll go on and on for like 35 to 40 minutes, just a nonstop fire hose of bats coming out of the cave. And I've got a video here to show you what it's, uh, what it's like. So there's the cave entrance. And the bats start to stream out. And they can travel up to 100 kilometers every single night. They'll spread out across the forest and they will just eat tons and literally tons of insects and then come back before the sunrise and then the next day they'll do it all again unless the weather is bad so think about this if it's raining sometimes they won't come out and it's a very simple reason why imagine if you go to a restaurant let's say uh you go to a buffet restaurant and you arrive at the front door and they say oh sorry we don't the kitchen is closed well you're not going to stay you're going to you're not going to bother right when it's raining the insects are not out so the bats will look they'll see that it's raining and then they go back into the cave and they don't bother so they're very smart they they know not to waste their energy and as they're flying you can actually hear the sort of the flip 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 of their wings as they go past they're very quiet so you have to completely silent to, to hear what's going on but it's just amazing how many there are just literally millions of them and sometimes you can hear the squeaking of their uh, echolocation most of the sounds they make are so high pitched that humans can't hear them at all but sometimes you can hear a little bit of their squeaking which i find quite fascinating as well and it just seems like something out of a science fiction movie. There's just so many of them. So basically, to I know we don't have that much time. So to, to, to sort of wrap things up, Borneo is home to some of this most pristine primary forest. There's forest here that has never been cut down. It's never been logged. Um, but there is a huge concern with Borneo and the forests there because they are disappearing. Uh, this is a satellite image of Borneo on the right, Sumatra on the left. Sumatra is another island uh, very close by. And you can see all the smoke. That smoke is from forest fires and a lot of it is specifically agricultural fires. So people will go in, they'll chop down the forest, they'll burn the land in order to clear it for, a lot of it's done for logging, some of it is done for cattle ranching, but the main culprit in Borneo right now is palm oil. And so they plant these palm trees and that uh, those palm trees produce these gigantic spiky fruit. And inside those fruit, there are these little, sort of like little nuts inside. And the oil that you squeeze out of these is, uh, it's very useful in a lot of different products. And we're seeing more and more companies basically destroying some of the ecosystem there in order to grow these. And you'll find this palm oil in lots of different products in things like cosmetics and food and detergents and various different things. So it's very important to, uh, to try to reduce the amount of palm oil that we consume. And there are ways to look and see different play, different uh, products use sustainable palm oil and things like that. But that, that gets kind of complicated. So just keep in mind that uh, these are things that we need to, to watch out for. But the good news, and there is some good news here, the good news is that studies about uh, deforestation have shown that it's slowing down in places like Borneo. So the governments are setting these stronger requirements for protecting the forest, which is really great. So even though we have lost quite a bit of forest, the future is actually looking pretty good for Borneo and all of the creatures that live there, including these wonderful orangutans and bats and such. 
um, as long as we are able to continue with these protections. And there are lots of big national parks there that, uh, that cannot be touched, so that's a really good thing. And my experience there was wonderful. It was fantastic. I, I don't think I've ever seen such dense, lush forests anywhere. And uh, we need to work together to, uh, to protect those. And they seem to be making that a bit of a priority, which is really, really good news. And I wanna thank you so much. I had such a great time there. It was one of my favorite places to, uh, to visit in recent times. Let me stop uh, sharing that. Go. And uh, I know Jesse wants to go there. I do. Well, I mean, you highlighted all these incredible animals and like they're, they're all on my bucket list. There's even some more pictures that people can check out on your Instagram below of some really unique and spectacular creatures we couldn't even fit into the presentation. Like that's how much you saw is that 20 okay. minutes is not enough, which is a good problem to have, really. I could do an entire presentation just on the insects that I saw there, the variety. We saw stick insects that were oh. this big. Yeah. Uh, we saw countless types of caterpillars and worms and and scorpions. You name it, we saw it. It was amazing. Huh. Well, I, I'm on the next plane after this broadcast and then straight to the airport. Uh, but until then, we'll we'll start with our Kahoot together. We've already got 68 of you in this, which is fantastic. If you're new to Kahoots, the faster you answer, the more points you get, and what you win is George and I's everlasting respect for paying attention to the presentation. Uh, and then what we're going to do is dive in with our classes for some Q&A. Again, we've got a bunch of groups joining us on YouTube. A big welcome to you guys. Our four classes live with us on camera, which is spectacular. I'm going to get us underway. And I'm I hoping haven't seen these questions. No, you have not. This is uh -oh. you, can help us, you can help us with all these as we get to the final few seconds of each one. Here we go. If I know the answers. Yeah, I think you will. i got a good feeling. Most of them were covered in your talk. Borneo is right on the equator. True or false? You don't know offhand? Maybe we think. Hmm. I, I consulted a handy world map for this and a globe. <laughs> I mean, we've been talking about the tropics, and the tropics actually does mean something. Like it is literally a region of the Earth defined by boundaries: the Tropic of Capricorn, Tropic of Cancer, uh, north and south of the equator. It is true. So Borneo is on the equator. So uh, almost a hundred of you were in this, which is amazing. Yes, we've got George has been to all the equatorial countries. Really, he's he's been everywhere. It's very <laughs> <laughs> almost. Um, everywhere. Almost everything. We're going to head to uh, question two. Now, this is a multi select, so there's, there could be more than one answer. Borneo is the world's third largest island. It is split Ooh. between which countries? We did talk about this at the beginning Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, and Brunei. See, when I think of Brunei, I think of the Sultan of Brunei. I don't know why That's that was in so many things when I was a kid, but that was like a big deal. I almost went there on this trip. Oh, next time. You've been to Indonesia. Time. You've been to Indonesia, though. Yes. Many, several times, probably. Uh, no, just once. Oh, just once. But I've been all across Indonesia to lots of different islands there. Well, Australia. Yeah, the answer is Malaysia. That. Sorry, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei. Is correct. Three of the four. Most of you got that. That was really good. So what are we at now? Oh, completely. We screwed up our leaderboard entirely. Yellow Dingo takes the lead. I want an animal that's in Borneo to win. It's my goal. Multi-selected oh, again. <laughs> what are some animals George saw in Borneo? Now, some of these you didn't cover, one of these you didn't cover, orangutan, sun bear, proboscis monkey, and a lot of bats, like so many bats. Deer Cave is a really special place. I think that's only the second time we've ever had Deer Cave featured in one of our broadcasts, and it is a really incredible location on the planet. It really is. There are so many caves there. So the answer is all of, oh, all of them. I don't know why proboscis monkey's in X. That's my fault, so I'm screwing up okay, the leaderboard. So I colors. didn't mention the sun bears, although Not. I did see sun bears. You did. You're going to have to check the Instagram page. That's my that's my bad. Groovy Horse uh, takes our lead as we go into the final question. We're going to the fourth question under protest with my terrible cahooting skills. <laughs> it's uh, okay. The stakes are low. <laughs> so low. So low. George has shared other stories with us about adventures in what places. And again, these are all on our YouTube channel. But Antarctica, Mexico's Night of Crystal Caves, the Galapagos, Vanuatu. What do we think? More than one answer again. This is the most multi-select we've ever had. Spoilers, spoilers, George. <laughs> I wasn't there for your Galapagos one, but I watched Antarctica, which is incredible, with those penguins walking in the background. The Crystal Caves was insane. And Vanuatu, you cover all the time. George, George is like, so for our students that might not know, having talked about Borneo today, you're like our volcano and storm expert guy. Like you are the number one person we have on for both anything that's blowing up or exploding or like howling gusts. Or like getting in, you're our guy. 
<laughs> All right, here's our leaderboard, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Stelton's class in Burlington first grade fives for our question. We got Cherokee, Texas. We got Gambles, Maryland. We got Peterborough. Doctor Juan, that wins. Way to go! That's a very, very unique name for you. If you are any of those people, let us know who you are in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, but I'm going to head to Mr. Stelton's class to kick us off with Q and A. We got 15 minutes together. Hey, great fives. Uh, how heavy can orangutans get? How heavy can they get, George? How heavy can an orangutan get? They can get, if, if memory serves correctly, they can get up to uh, over over a hundred over hundred kilograms for sure. Um, yeah. They're dense. They have a lot of muscle, and yeah. even though they've got those lanky arms. Uh, it's there's not that much fat. It's mostly muscle. So that way they're way they weigh a lot. They weigh much larger, much more than a big adult human. Yeah. And I, I like that you mentioned the fact that they sort of look baggy. Like I've heard them described as like a sack full of oranges. But, you know, what the sack is filled with is muscle like they are solid as can be all the apes. If they got in a fight with a person, it would be a very quick fight. Right. Like we imagine, are. Uh, imagine yeah. hanging from branches for all day, every day. Like. There you go. You know, they're really good at doing pull-ups. Absolutely, they are. they're an incredible speed. They're they're a really special ape. I I think they're my favorite, and they're so. For anyone who's ever had the chance to visit an accredited zoo where you see an orangutan in person, Toronto Zoo is an example that I grew up with. I mean, there's more interaction and meeting in a glance with an orangutan than pretty much anything on earth, and it's a really special thing. So I'm glad we got that question. They're so intelligent. Class, Cherokee, Texas. So George, Cherokee is like the smallest town we ever have on. It's like half the town is in this classroom. It's <laughs> ready to have you back. Hi guys, welcome back. I might have been to Cherokee. Where is Cherokee, Texas? I might have been there. In the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, middle of nowhere. It's northwest of Austin. It's like, where? Northwest of Austin. Northwest of Austin. Okay, I might have been through there on a storm chase one day. He like he's a, he's been in all of nowhere Texas because you, when you're following tornadoes, that's what you're doing is like Oklahoma, Texas, all the time. It's very tough. What's your question? If there was no animals or people for the leech, how long would it survive? Ooh. Oh well, well they they wouldn't, right? They're, if you take away their food source, then they would all starve. Um, think of it like a like a uh, like a panda. A panda eats nothing but bamboo, basically. If you took away the bamboo, there would be nothing for them to eat. They're not capable of adapting to another type of food. They're not going to suddenly become uh, a carnivore. So if you take away the food source for these leeches, the mammals that live there typically, uh, they, they will starve. Leeches can feed off of each other, though. So there are instances where a leech has filled itself with blood, dropped off, and then a nearby leech notices latches onto the other leech and steals the blood from that leech, killing the first leech. Huh. Well, there, but still, you need something to get the blood from in the first place. Yes, but thank you. Well, yes, that. leeches can be blood thieves from each other. I love it. We were talking, George and I, before the broadcast began, that some scientists have started to see that you can go into jungles and get the leeches and take the blood out of them and find out what animals live in the forest. There's really reclusive animals. You can get like a thousand leeches and go like, okay, 500 of them have orangutan blood. So we know that there's a lot of orangutan in this area, which is so cool because there's animals that are really hard to find that the leeches can be a guide to. So I'm so glad we got that question. Thank you, Ms. Padgett's class. We will come back to everybody, by the way. Ms. Raheem, Gambrels, Marilyn, come on in, guys. Hey. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having us. Go ahead, Lydia. What is the most amazing thing that you have seen involving biodiversity? Ooh. The, the, sorry, the wildest thing I've seen in terms of biodiversity? Yes, the yes. most amazing thing in terms of biodiversity. No pressure, oh. George. <laughs> amazing thing, I'm looking at my map. Uh, uh, I'm gonna have to say, as, as amazing as, as Borneo is, but the Galapagos Islands are really fascinating because you have several different islands out there and the animals that live on those islands evolved separately. They're similar, but they're different. So you have different species living on this on each island. And it really is amazing. It's like this natural laboratory to study the effects of evolution. And that's exactly what Charles Darwin did. He went there and did exactly that. So in terms of the diversity of creatures, that is a place that really shows us how changes happen over thousands and thousands and millions of years. So that is probably the most fascinating place. And you can go there and 
the animals are not afraid of you because they have no no fear of people. Uh, tortoises will walk right up to you. Sea uh, lions. Sea lions. It's just, it's mind blowing. Yes. Every time we feature the Galapagos, it, it's amazing how special that is. And there's dozens of videos on our YouTube channel. We've done Galapagos a lot. So if you want to check that out, that's a great question. Thanks, Lydia. Yeah, um, thank you. Mr. Douglas's class, let's head to Peterborough. Come on in at Adam Scott and uh, go for it, hey guys. Hey. <laughs> Um, well, hello, I'm Olivia, and I have a question. Um, have you ever been bitten or stung by any other animals beside a leech? <laughs> Count the ways. <laughs> oh, yes. So, where do I begin? Um, I've been bitten by a mosquito in on the island of Dominica and caught dengue fever, which is very similar to malaria. That was not fun. I was uh, hallucinating with a crazy fever in the emergency room after that. That was not good. I've been bitten by a bat in a cave in Kenya and had to get rabies shots because of that. Um, in Australia, I was stung by a box jellyfish, which is the most oh. venomous creature in the world. And I was filming for a TV show I was hosting at the time. And the person I was with is a local expert. And he, he grabbed one of these jellyfish and dragged it across my arm so that I could experience oh. what it felt like to be stung by a box jellyfish uh i cannot recommend zero out of ten no <laughs> i i mean i was expecting the story to be like i was swimming along and oh it accidentally hit me not like someone intentionally you're the there, there's some youtube stars now that do this like all the time coyote peterson's like everything let's see what everything sting and bite feels like That's yeah funny. i cannot recommend the box jellyfish though okay. it's, uh, it's a bad time <laughs> do as george says not as george does <laughs> Um, I'm going to head to YouTube for one, and then we're going to do another round with our questions. Miss Higgins class, they are virtual, and they have got so many questions uh, in the remote grade eight program in Guelph, or Upper Grand, sorry, um, Upper Grand, all about conservation. So we talked about what is destroying wildlife in Borneo. Esther wants to know what are we working to do to protect the biodiversity in Borneo. Anything you can tell us more about what we're doing to save this incredible place would be fantastic. Yeah, the, the biggest, the single biggest threat to uh, to biodiversity in, in Borneo, pretty much anywhere, is habitat loss. Just the fact that there are so many people spreading out into the, the jungle, into, into the rainforest, for various reasons. The cities are getting larger, agricultural areas are getting larger, uh, these palm oil trees. When you fly into Borneo, sometimes you'll look out and you'll see beautiful green everywhere and then you realize it's row after row after row of uh oil palm trees that have been planted there these gigantic plantations so that really is habitat loss for sure is the it's the biggest threat it's not hunting it's not uh disease or anything like that. it's it's habitat loss these these animals are losing their homes they got no place to live and therefore there can't be as many of them so what we need to do is to we need to treat those places as sacred and, and allow them the space to live and do what they do. Yeah. I always like highlighting these things because habitat loss is it's a universal thing leading to a lot of like sort of populations lowering and endangering of animals all around the globe. And when we give wildlife that space, like when we give it the chance to rewild and give it the chance to be left alone for a bit, it comes back in a huge way. Like life will find a way. It's in Jurassic Park and it really fits the bill. I mean, if you leave a kelp forest for 10 years, the amount of biodiversity that comes back there is astonishing. We're starting to actually rewild the world in a lot of places, which is really Absolutely. I, I've been to the radioactive uh, city of Pripyat near Chernobyl, and walking through the abandoned city, you can see how nature has returned. Even though this place is uninhabitable by humans because it's radioactive, the trees have grown back, and it's just amazing how nature returns despite everything. It's, it's, it's just give it some space, give it some time and nature finds a way. I think it's on Netflix and I think it's a life on our planet, David Attenborough uh, series. And they start in Pripyat. Like they talk about that, that you go in and it's like this abandoned city. And at the end, they highlight all the amazing biodiversity that's there. So it's a really special story if kids want to check it out and I'll make sure they have that link at the end as well. Um, we're going to head back to Mr. Steltman, Padgett, uh, Raheem and uh, Mr. Douglas's class in order. We've got five minutes rapid fire round. Uh, come on in grade fives and, Take us away. Hey, guys. I'm Apollo, and uh, what is a sun bear, and what do they eat? Ooh, what's a sun bear? Thanks, Apollo. 
Sun bears. So sun bears are they're they're a species of bear. Of course, we've got brown bears, black bears, polar bears, panda bears. Uh, sun bears live on uh, in in that part of Southeast Asia. They're very rare, and uh, they they're. I did get to see some while I was there, but not out in the wild. Only in. The they're opportunistic yeah. and uh they're pretty small they're like the smallest species mm -hmm. of bear you like they're about the size of a large dog maybe a little bit bigger depends on the size of the dog i suppose <laughs> yeah they're really great at climbing trees yeah and uh, they are they're critically endangered so if you ever get the opportunity to see a sun bear particularly in the wild then that is a very special encounter they are one of the species on borneo that really require our protection more than than the others yeah i was saying to george before we got underway with the broadcast like i've seen a sun bear in like a documentary maybe twice in my life like lions you go there are lions tigers are trickier but you can find tigers in some places fairly reliably sun bear i've like never seen like they're really really hard to spot george you're extraordinarily lucky to have had that chance and uh, i'm glad we got that question um miss Paget's class back to where george probably went at some point uh come on in turkey hi guys uh, so my question is how fast can one of those bats uh fly Ooh. oh how fast can they fly that's a good question i'm not sure i i, I don't have a i didn't have a, like a, a radar gun to uh to, to measure their speed but they fly about the same speed about the same speed is maybe a little bit slower than a, than than like a, a bird like a like a, a robin or a, or a seagull yep. the um they don't glide as much as birds do they tend to flap more so they don't take advantage of some of the the wind currents the way that some birds do so a little bit slower than most birds yeah. uh, but they have tremendous endurance as i mentioned earlier they can fly sometimes 100 kilometers during their nightly rounds looking for insects so they're not super speedy but they are endurance flyers. And interestingly, there are bat hawks that yes. will fly around the exit of this cave waiting for the bats to emerge because for them, if you're a hawk, a very swiftly flying hawk, suddenly you've got this, this buffet of meal. They can just fly through the cloud of bats and snatch a couple of them out of the air. It's, actually, it's one of my favorite things to witness in nature. And I was going to highlight the bat hawk if you didn't. So there you go. Like, it's so easy for them. They're so much better flyers than bats. It's like a smorgasbord. It's like, you take, you know, apples out of a barrel. There you go. Oh, free bat. Nice, another rat, right? Like, there's nothing they can do to elude them because they're such better uh, yeah. in the air. Great. Sometimes you'll have snakes perched at the cave entrance. And as, as the bats go past, the snakes will just snatch the, uh, the bats out of the air. So I don't know if you've ever seen this, but in Venezuela too, there's a giant centipede, like a 17 inch monster. And it climbs to the roof of caves and catches bats on the wing, which is the most like right up there with a leech sucking the blood out of another leech. Like, it's just like, it's no, it's like all sorts of no. I don't want it ever. Yeah. Well, really quickly, Jesse, when I was in Borneo, we saw one of the giant centipedes they have there. It was the only creature that my guide was afraid of. Yes. They're horrifying. They're like super muscular. They're powerful. They got potent venom. Like, don't I? I don't even like the ones that live in my house. But never mind the huge ones in the jump. Anyway, right. <laughs> it's my only animal in the world I don't like are centipedes. Like, that's it. Um, Miss Raheem, I'm heading to you, and then Mr. Douglas to wrap up. Come on back into Maryland, guys. Hey. Okay. Hi. Is there any other threats to biodiversity globally? Um, Ooh, any threats to biodiversity globally that you can share with us outside of habitat loss? Sorry, say that again. Yeah, any threats to biodiversity globally? Like when you mentioned habitat loss. Oh, really yeah, absolutely. Else. Absolutely. Climate change is a huge one. Yeah. Um, what's happening in a lot of places is as certain parts of the world are getting warmer, other places are getting colder. And so the habitat, the, the, the habitable zone for certain species in terms of temperature is moving. And so the creatures that live in some of these places, especially in the oceans, uh, where oceans getting warmer and more acidic, it's uh, affecting a lot of the life that lives there. Um, pollution, of course, is a huge problem. If there's a lot of polluters in industrialized countries, that pollution eventually spreads around the world. Uh, that's a concern. Uh, there are lots of things that are happening that end up spreading around the entire planet. And unfortunately, the, you know, the, the creatures have no control over that. They don't even know what's happening. They just know that it's changing. they're... they're, they're their home is 
becoming less and less habitable to some species. So we're going to see a lot of species migrating because of climate change, uh, going to places that are warmer or colder for them. But a lot of places, a lot of these uh, creatures aren't able to, to relocate. Uh, they just don't have the means to do that. So that's becoming a problem in a lot of places. So it's a long list, but those are some of the, the big ones. <laughs> For our students, if you're keen, so conservation is the biggest part of what we do. We always feature conservation stories. In just a couple of weeks, we've got our Global Biodiversity Festival, which is 50 broadcasts. Every single one is going to be in a different country around the world talking about conservation challenges and some of the huge successes. We did our Hope for Conservation series back in October, so you can look that up as well. Uh, but lots of opportunities to keep learning going about this, because it's a really, it's a topic close to all of our hearts. So thank you for that, guys. Um, Mr. Douglas's class, I'm going to head to you, and I'll take a really quick one from YouTube to wrap up and give our classes a chance to say goodbye. But Peterborough, welcome in. <laughs> hey, uh, great presentation, George. Thank you. Hey, some people talk about uh, solutions for the uh, habitat loss in um, in Borneo is you know sustainable palm oil. I'm just wondering, is there such a thing, or is it just a mirage and a smokescreen? So there is a uh, certification for sustainable palm oil. Um, there's an acronym for it, which escapes me right now. I can't remember the what the acronym is. So if you're looking for palm oil products. Uh, or if you're, if you're looking for products that do contain palm oil, then look for that certification. Uh, just do a Google search. I don't know it off the top of my head. I've, I've had a bit of a, uh, my, my brain's uh, letting me down at this moment. Um, but yes, there are ways to do palm oil sustainably. Um, yeah. And it's something that if we're going to continue using that product, we have to really look for and continue to use those sustainable methods. Yeah. So it is, it is possible. It just, it's not as profitable, right? That's the thing. And in order for, <laughs> real quick, there's, there's yeah. always gonna be a balance between sustainability and profitability, right? And a lot of companies are really focusing on the profitability side, but that's very short-sighted. And if you completely destroy all the forest in Borneo, then we're gonna lose things that are way more important. So yes, there is there is a way to do it, and uh, the way there are people out there that are working very hard on that. So I found the link below. So rspo.org, if you want to find that out, it's the roundtable for sustainable palm oil. So if people want to check that out when they're done, and it's a really it's a sort of scary time in the world right now. There's a lot of challenges facing wildlife around the globe, but it's also a lot of great challenges that people are really coming together in a big way to make a positive difference on. So it's very exciting in and of itself at the same time. And again, it's not all going to be peaches and cream in the next few decades, but there's a lot of good being done. And I think that the huge trend is positive now. Certainly everyone under 16, you know the facts, you're keen. Um, there's million kid marches all over the world on behalf of climate change and biodiversity loss and more. And so it's a really... Um, I'm eternally hopeful, and I think, George, your experience will hopefully lead you to the same conclusion right now. It's not like we don't know how to solve these problems. Yeah. We we know. We know what we need to do. We're starting to do it. We just need to do it more and more quickly, and I think that's a really positive takeaway. I've got a, a, a softball question for you from Ms. Brundage's class. What is the most dangerous insect to humans that you've encountered from Patrick? <laughs> Hands down, the most dangerous insect in the world to humans is the mosquito. The mosquito carries so many different diseases, Zika virus, malaria, dengue fever, uh, yellow fever. There, there are so many fatalities year round. It is the number one animal killer of humans. That's it. Hands down, mosquito. No question. No, forever. So I'm glad we, we got that one. So our lessons today are... Mosquitoes are scary. Go to Borneo. It's awesome. And don't let anyone drag box jellyfish over your arm. Okay. That's just a big no-no. Uh, Those are all true. <laughs> George, uh, I do want to encourage our classes. Check you out on Instagram. Check out furiousearth.com to see all your latest and greatest expeditions. There's so much to discover there when you're done this broadcast. And again, our YouTube channel has everything you've ever done with us. 20 plus programs, thunderbolts and lightning. Check it out when you're done. It's so cool. Um, all the volcano stuff, more Antarctica, penguins in the background, live on camera with George. Um, always such a pleasure, man. Uh, what we do to end every broadcast, as you well know, I'm going to bring back in our classes, Mr. Raheem's group, uh, Mr. Douglas's class, Ms. Paget's class in Cherokee. If you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you and farewell, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Guys, and we'll see you all soon. <laughs>